Okay, good afternoon. Yes, my, my voice is a little off today because I'm not well, so just please bear with me. Um, but the sermon I have today, um, I think I'm going to call The Brutish King. Um, so what I'm preaching is uh, on a brutish or foolish man. So brutish, um, it, it means generally stupid or foolish, but more than that, there are actually traits of a brutish man. And it's more like an animal or a beast. So the, uh, the definition of brutish is uh, brutal or cruel, is gross or coarse, carnal, sensual, uncivilized, bestial, like an animal. So these kind of people, these brutish men, uh, they're reactive and not wise. You know, so they, these are people who don't think ahead, but they actually just react to what they see and they just sort of act off the cuff. Um, so they don't, they don't plan their actions, they don't plan their words, they don't plan their thoughts, they don't think about much at all. So today we're looking at the attributes of a man, um, and that's King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, so he was both a man of great knowledge and stature, and he was a great ruler of Babylon, but that was in a worldly sense. As far as it came to the things of God, he was actually a very brutish man. So we do see it towards the end of, the, of his reign, he did get right with God. Um, and I believe he's in heaven right now, but he still had traits that we can learn from before his transformation. So we'll be spending quite a bit of time in Daniel, so I'll get you to start there in Daniel chapter 1. But we'll see here in Daniel chapter 1, the, uh, sorry, Brother Michael, can you just turn that down a little bit more? In uh, chapter 1, we'll see false gods, superstition and idolatry are a sign of a brutish man. So in Daniel chapter 1 verse 3, it says, And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he could bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favoured and skilful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, in whom they might teach the learning and the tongues of the Chaldeans. So we see here that Daniel and his friends, they were not brutish men, but they are the exact opposite of a brutish man. They were skillful in wisdom, cunning and knowledge. Not just in general, but they also had the wisdom and knowledge of God. And this is a picture of how we should be as God's children as well. It's what God's called us to be, wise among the unwise and bringing truth and light to the world. So in verse 17 of Daniel chapter 1, it says, As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days before the king had said he should bring unto them, the prince and the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them was all found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. So again, we see Daniel and his friends that were wise in the things of God. And that's why they stood out against the men of the land, against the best astrologers and best magicians, the Chaldeans. They stood out because they had the wisdom of God, which is far better than anything this world has. So in verse 6 of Daniel, just go back, it says, Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah and Shadrach, and to Meshach, uh, to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. So I'll get you to turn to Daniel chapter 2 now. But we're going to look at Nebuchadnezzar and these traits in contrast to these great men of God. So in this passage, he gives these men names according to his false god. As we know, it's another name for the devil or Satan, often in the Old Testament. He's a false god of the heathen. I'll just read to you from Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 2. It says, Declare ye among the nations... And publish and set up a standard, publish and conceal not. Say, Babylon is taken, Bel is confounded, Merodach is broken in pieces, her idols are confounded, her images are broken in pieces. So this name Belteshazzar that is given to, to Daniel is of the false god Bel, which we know to be Satan. You know, one of the many names given to, to Satan's Bel, Belial, you know, Beelzebub, um, all these names. So we see that he names these men of God after his own false god. That's the sign of a brutish man. So you're there in Daniel chapter 2, look at verse 31. 
It says, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold a great image, this great image whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast, his arms of silver, his belly as a thighs of brass, his legs of iron, the part of iron, the part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, that it were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold, broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, that the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. So Daniel goes on to interpret this dream, and we know that this is a prophecy of spiritual Babylon, um, in as many forms over history, and of course in the future Babylon to come. But Nebuchadnezzar, we see in chapter 3, if you just want to turn over the page, in Daniel chapter 3, verse 1, this is how Nebuchadnezzar responds to the dream and to the interpretation. It says, Nebuchadnezzar made the king made an image of gold whose height was three, sco three score cubits and the breadth thereof was six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent up, gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, judges, treasurers, counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Um, and uh, so then he gets this proclamation that every time you hear the psaltery, the cornet, the flute, um, that you have to bow down and worship this image. And this is, this is what he creates for himself. But he actually missed the complete point of the dream. He's making himself a god to be worshipped and, you know, an idol of gold. This is not what the dream was about. It was about the spirit of Babylon, you know. And, I mean, he already saw that it was going to be destroyed when the stone came and destroyed the image. But he still just goes, okay, I'm just going to create an idol. People can bow down and worship me then. You know, him and his false god. But that's a foolish and brutish thing for this man to do. You know, to make himself an idol of gold. But the brutish man, they love false gods and they love idols. And that's one thing that we'll see, you know, throughout this sermon. But they also devo uh, desire the worship of themselves. Because they are God. They are their own God. They are the creator God of their own imagination. And they create an idol you know, in that image, um, you know, and that's, I mean, you see in society today, how many, how many statues are there of football stars, celebrities, you know, these kind of things, and, and they want to make idols of these people, they want to, they want to bow down and worship them, but they're British people who do this, you know, they want to worship man rather than God, right. um, but yeah, they, they, they give obeisance to idols they make with their own hands, we'll see how pointless that is in a minute. But we'll continue in Daniel 3, verse 8. It says, Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, sackbut, sultry, dosma, all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee, nor served thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So there's a great example of what we should do, is we should not bow down and worship these false gods. We should not capitulate to, to what they're requesting of us, even these wicked, brutish rulers who can kill you at any time. It's still... You know, that's why we see the mark of the beast and all of that. It's like, what are we going to do? We're not going to bow down and worship the Antichrist to receive the mark. We're going to lose our lives because of it. But that's what we're commanded to do. And they understood that. Continue in verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do you not serve my gods? nor worship the golden image which I have set up. Now if you be ready at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, sackbut, sultry, dosma, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if you worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? So we see here beginning the hasty nature of the brutish man. You know, his rage and fury at hearing that these men would not worship him or his false gods. In verse 16 continues, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, 
we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So you can see these wise men, the opposite of the brutish man, they are steadfast and sure because they know the word of God and they will not bow down to another God because the, you know, the first commandment is thou shalt have no other gods. And if you remember that commandment, you're not going to do that because they know what the truth is and they know what they believe. They will not be persuaded even though there might be peer pressure to bow down and worship them because everyone else is doing it. They still stand by and say, no, we're not going to do that. They would not be persuaded. They're level-headed, you know, as opposed to the British king who is just completely operating on, you know, by the seat of his pants, as it were, you know, and just making quick, rash decisions without actually thinking about the consequences. But these men knew the consequences of not fearing God. They knew the consequences of bowing down to worship a false god. And those consequences are greater than anything this king could ever do. And they didn't want to face that. So we see this response here from... Nebuchadnezzar in verse 19 then was ne Nebuchadnezzar full of fury and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach Meshach and Abednego therefore he spake and commanded they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated and he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach Meshach and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace and we all know how that story ends you know the Lord performs a miraculous salvation of these men um, we see, you know, there's Jesus Christ in the midst of the, of the three men in the fiery furnace. They're completely without harm. Um, but he's also teaching Nebuchadnezzar and those wicked men around him a lesson. So those who cast the men in were killed by the heat of the furnace. But God wasn't done humbling Nebuchadnezzar just yet. There actually is more to come. But we're seeing a pattern here with the brutish man, that rage and that fury, that quickness to act, that, that rashness. Um, and that violence as well, the wickedness. You know, there's no thought, but it's just an emotional and hasty spirit. So we continue in verse 28 of Daniel chapter 3. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. But we even see here Nebuchadnezzar is making more hasty decrees. <laughs> he hasn't learned anything, and the British man just doesn't learn anything. But it's foolish and brutish to even make decrees and to make judgments, especially if you're in a position of authority where real people can get hurt. You know, you should be taking counsel and not being hasty in your decrees. And while it looks like it looks good on the surface, it's still a bloody and violent decree that he's making here. Because we, as God's people, we don't force anyone to worship our God. You know, nor to receive salvation. They must do it willingly. So we don't force people, but brutish men will actually force you to convert at, at gunpoint or at, at sword point. Okay. You know, and we see that with Islam and Catholicism. They're both attempted in this manner to convert people to their wicked false religion through violence. But our religion is voluntary. It's whosoever will may come and drink of the water of life freely. So I'll get you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 10. So in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the sign of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them, for the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth the tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe, they deck it with silver and with gold, they fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move, it move not. They are upright at the, as the palm tree, but speak not. 
They must needs be born, because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it is them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O King of the nations? For to thee doth it appertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the nations in all their kingdoms there is none like unto thee. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanity. So what he's saying is these idols, these ones who cut down these trees and make these idols, it says they are altogether brutish and foolish, and the stock is a doctrine of vanities. In, uh, go down to verse 14, Jeremiah chapter 10, 14. Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image. For his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. They are vanity in the work of errors. In the time of their visitation, they shall perish. So we see the works of idols, the graven images, it's all vanity. There is nothing in them. They're just empty. They can't, they can't you know, speak. They can't hear. They can't help. They can't even walk on their own. They have to be born everywhere. They have to be carried. You know, they can't do anything. But, and that's the thing. What do you think you're going to learn from a piece of wood? What, what's it going to teach you? If it can't speak, it can't hear, it can't do anything. You know, so why worship something that's lower than you? You know, that just makes no sense at all. God is above us all. So we worship a living God. But they're brutish in their knowledge because they lack the wisdom and knowledge that God has given to us. That's his holy word, the King James Bible. But even nature itself speaks that there is, there is a creator. There is a higher power. There is a God who created the heavens and the earth. But they're... Ref- they refuse to acknowledge that and would rather worship a piece of stone or a piece of wood. I go down to verse 21, Jeremiah chapter 10. For, for the pastors have become brutish and have not sought the Lord, therefore they shall not prosper and all their flocks shall be scattered. So even the pastors, the teachers are brutish. These are the, these are the ones who are supposed to be leading them in the wisdom and word of God. But they're brutish, they're stupid, they're, they're like beasts. And what are they going to lead other people into? Being beasts like themselves. You know, there, and there are many also of these brutish pastors who pervert the word of God. And I like what it says about them in Jude. I'll read to you from Jude uh, verse 10. It says, But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsayings of Korah. So these brutish pastors, these false prophets and teachers, of which there are many warnings in the New Testament about these men, but it says they know not, they speak evil of the things they know not. So they speak evil against the word of God. These are people who mock the word of God. And they they mock what we believe, they mock what we teach. Uh, But they're contrary to God. Because they're speaking, they're speaking evil of the things they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts. The things they do understand, the carnal, the carnal nature of themselves, they're corrupted in their carnal man. And all they know is wickedness and violence and idolatry and filthy perversion. That's what comes out of their mouth. And when, when a brutish man becomes a pastor, you'll see that he'll lead others into that as well. And it's so wicked when when a a teacher of the word who should be wise in the things of God, who should know the things of God, he's got to have the wisdom of God in order to be a pastor. Qualifications are you've got to know the word of God. You've got to be a man of God. These men are brutish. They know nothing. They're vanity. And yet they want to be teachers of the law. You know, but a pastor is the opposite of a brutish man. He's a man who's proven himself to the church. He's proven himself to God. He's studied to show himself approved. You know, and he's clear in his teachings. He's not dishonest about it like these false teachers are. They're just dishonest about what the Bible says because, you know, again, they speak evil of the things which they know not. They don't understand the word of God because they're spiritually discerned. So then they mock them. Uh, if you want to turn to Jeremiah chapter 51, after that will be in Acts 17. But there's nothing you can learn from these brutish men, these false teachers, because they don't understand the word of God. They haven't got the spirit of God. There's nothing they can teach you. So, like, like Brother Sam preached this morning, just don't listen to these people. They've got nothing to offer. In fact, they're going to lead you down a path worse than their own. 
So in, in Jeremiah 51, 17, it says, Every man is brutish by his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image, for his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. They are vanity, the work of errors. In the time of their visitation they shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them. He is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. So it's even comparing that these guys who are vain, you know, these brutish men, is comparing Christ and saying, look, Christ is not like them. You know, he's the former of all things, but Israel's the rod of his, of his inheritance, but the Lord of hosts is his name. Like, we're called to be like Christ. We're called to walk after the manner of Christ. And Christ was not a brutish man. You know, it says he's, he's not like them. You know, he's nothing like them. In Acts uh, chapter 17, I'm uh, oh, sorry, i get there in a second. Acts 17, 22 is where we'll be. But again, we see the brutish men, they love their idols and their false gods, but they're also highly superstitious people. You'll see superstition often goes with idolatry and, and with, with having their own false gods. We'll always see that correlation between false religion and superstition. And even if you've been out knocking doors for any length of time, you come across ho houses you see, you know, they'll have the statues out front, they'll have the incense burning, you can smell it when you knock on the door. And what do they always say? I have my religion, I'm fine. You know, these people, they're brutish. They're not fine. You know, they're condemned and on their way, way to hell, but they're stubborn in that they would rather keep their idols, they'd rather keep their incense, they'd rather keep their false gods than to even answer and hear the matter of another god, of the god of, you know, who did create all things. A living god, not a dead one. So verse 22 in Acts 17, we got Paul here speaking um, in Mars Hill. And he says, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar to this inscription, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heavens and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel, feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. And isn't that a wonderful thing? We know that he's never far from any one of us, especially us who are saved. We know he dwells in us and us in him. But even out in the world, that those people know that there's people like us out there where the Lord is with them and the Lord's never far from them. Uh, so we were, uh, at verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of our own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone given by art and men's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Now that's another that's a verse you'll hear twisted so often. But it's about these men need to repent of the false idols that they have and to turn to the one true living God, to just believe on Jesus Christ and receive eternal life. That's all Paul's preaching here. He's not preaching you've got to repent of your sins. He's teaching you you've got to repent of your idolatry and, and believing that you can worship a God of stone, a God of wood, a God of silver or gold. When God is none of those things, he cannot be encompassed by any, any of those things. I'll just finish verse 31. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he would judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. So again, it's just saying how Christ is going to judge the world. But there are so many religions based around superstition and idolatry. Again, you know, you'll see it when you go out soul winning. Um, Catholicism is probably one of the largest, but you've also got Hinduism, Buddhism, and I'm sure there are many other Eastern religions with the same, same kind of things. But they worship gods of their own making. They're dead gods carved from wood, from stone, molten from metals, such as gold and silver or bronze. But it says these gods can neither see nor hear nor do because they're dead, but we worship a living God. That's the difference between us and them. And that's what Paul's trying to teach them here. In Acts. 
So we'll see verse 32 continue. And when they heard of the, ma- the matter, sorry, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear again, hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dion- Dionysius and a Raphagite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. So the, the brutish man is left with one of two ways to respond. And we see this here. When Paul explains the gospel clearly to them, there are some who mocked. And that's a true brutish man who's, who's too stubborn to receive the truth, and he chooses rather to mock the word of God than receive it. And you've also, you'll, you'll notice that these people do it out of a willful ignorance. You know, so don't be fooled. These people, they know better. It is a willful ignorance. But you've also got that other side. We see that some believed and were saved. And that's truly the only way out for the brutish man, is to just believe that's, that's why we preach the gospel. You know, some might need a wake-up call like Nebuchadnezzar, you know, but they might, not get, they might not get a sign so outward. You know, as it says, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear him. You know, you opening your mouth to preach the gospel, that's the warning the British man gets. And sometimes it's all they're going to get. So I hope we also do see, um, I'll get you to turn to Habakkuk chapter 2. But we do see a curse. It's actually a curse to worship idols. So the Lord says this in Deuteronomy chapter 4. It says in the, Deuteronomy 4.27, And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and ye shall be left few in number among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you. And there ye shall serve God's, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him, with all thy heart, with all thy soul. So some of these people are out in the wilderness, and the reason why they're brutish men is because they've been left out there because they want to serve these false gods. But if they seek the Lord, they'll find him. You know, if they genuinely want the Lord, you know, th- then when the gospel comes, they'll believe it. They won't be like these men who mock, but they'll be like those who believed. So there's, th- there's two types of the British man. There's the one who can get saved, who is not going to be stubborn, but there's the one who's not. We don't know. We just preach them the gospel and let them make their own mind up. Um... But yes, yeah, scattering, scattering them into the heathen nations and serving those false gods, that was a curse from God that would come upon them if they didn't keep the covenant. But you're there in, in Habakkuk 2.18. It says, What profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it? The molten image and a teacher of lies. The maker of his work trusteth therein to make dumb idols. Woe well, unto him that saith of the wood awake, to the dumb stone arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. So again, we just see the foolishness of these people, these brutish people, you know, who are like telling the idol, awake, but it can't awake. They're saying, teach me, but it can't teach you anything. It's dumb, it's stupid, it can't do anything. And if you worship something, you're stupid too. You worship a piece of stone, you're an idiot. You're a brutish man. You know, you need to repent of that. But we're also commanded as God's people to avoid idolatry. You know, so when we see people with idols, and we see it quite often, you know, they may be sacrificing their food to idols or whatever. So that's why we're supposed to abstain from that, not for our conscience, but for theirs. Um, but those people, you know, they're brutish and unwise when they've got idols in their front yard and they're burning incense to them, worshipping them. We're commanded to flee idolatry. You know, and they just need to, they need the Lord and they need to hear and believe the gospel. You know, that they might have a chance, but we shouldn't be friends with them. We shouldn't yoke up with them. We shouldn't make them people that we spend our time with. And that's exactly what Brother Sam was preaching this morning. You know, we need to avoid the foolish and brutish people. Preach them the gospel, but other than that, you've got nothing to say to them. So we'll move on to the second point, which is another attribute of the British man. We'll get you to turn back to Daniel chapter 2. Now we saw some of this already in Daniel chapter 3. It's about the angry, violent, unpredictable nature of the British man. I'll just read to you from Daniel 3.13. So then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury 
commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they brought these men before the king. So we see that his rage and fury, this is how he operates. He's not thinking clearly, he's just operating out of his wrath and fury. So you're there in verse 10 of chapter 2 of Daniel. It says the Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore there is no king, lord, nor ruler that ask such things of any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it's a rare thing that the king requireth. There is none other that can show it before the king, except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. So again, he gets furious. And he's like, well, just if you can't do anything, you, you can't interpret this dream for me, then I'm just going to kill you all. I mean, you see the hasty nature, but the wicked, violent nature of this brutish man. And he's so unpredictable too. And you'll, you'll notice that all the time. But that's the thing. It also leads in good men, Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego also being caught up in this decree. So he's so hasty to respond and kill all of these wise astrologers and Chaldeans. But, you know, again, you see good actual wise men, men of God, um, being led to the slaughter as well. And so you'll see that a brutish man will be very hasty to answer. You know, he's not going to consider, you know, he's not going to consider his ways. He'll always have the last word. It feels like he has to right every wrong. But he doesn't understand that one simple truth in Proverbs seventeen twenty eight that even a fool when he holdeth his peace is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. So even Jesus, when he stood before Pilate, he said not a word. He didn't answer the man. He knew he was a wicked and brutish man and a violent man, and he didn't answer him a word. When his accusers accused him, the Lord just took it patiently. See, you don't always have to be right. You don't always have to answer every accusation. You don't always have to answer every foolish question. Because you know what's true. Jesus knew what was true. He knew that the accusations were false. And, you know, if they believe a lie, let them believe it. It's, you know, you don't have to correct everyone. In Proverbs 20, 26, 4 and 5, it says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. And in, 20, and in 5, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. So regardless of how you answer the fool, you're wrong. <laughs> There's no winning. The best thing you can do is just shut your mouth and say nothing. Because if you answer him, you know, then you're just going to look foolish like him. If you, you know, if you don't answer him according to his folly, he's just going to go away and think, well, I'm, you know, I'm right. But it doesn't matter. Just let him think he's right. Just let him be a fool. You know, you don't have to be a fool with him. You have that choice. Answering not at all is sometimes the best choice. In James 1.19, it says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So a hasty judgment and hasty speech, you know, that does not work the righteousness of God. It, rather, it actually causes the name of God to be blasphemed by those outside. And we see that Nebuchadnezzar, many times, making these hasty judgments and decrees that end up causing problems for God's people because he just didn't think it through. And while God does deliver his people in these instances, but it's a sign of a brutish man that can't control his anger. He doesn't take time to consider the words or actions before he does them. In Proverbs 22, verse 24, it says, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. So again, what can we learn from these people? Just as you can't be taught by some dumb idol, you're also not going to learn anything from the brutish man except how to be brutish. He's just going to make you like him. That's not what we're called to be. The one exception is to preach them the gospel to give them a chance to get themselves out of that brutish man and to become a child of God. And again, I'm not saying that, you know, people, saved people can also have these brutish traits. That's why I'm preaching this sermon is because we can, we can do a lot of these things, you know. So we need to make sure that we don't 
walk according to the brutish men and we don't hang out with brutish men and learn from them. In Proverbs 23, 9, it says, Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. So it doesn't sound like you're going to do him much good, you know, when you're trying to correct him. Um, but that's the thing, the, the brutish man will not receive correction, whether it's from the gospel, whether it's from the word of God, whether it's just from you giving good, good, good counsel. They're just not going to hear it. They're going to be stubborn. And we saw that before when they, those were the ones who mocked at the word of God when they heard about the resurrection. They weren't interested in the truth. You know. And we also see that in Nebuchadnezzar. If you want to turn to Psalms chapter 94. And yeah, just people who are too proud to receive correction. Just, I mean, at, at some point, you're just wasting your time. They have to humble themselves before they'll receive anything, including the gospel. You've got to be humble to receive the gospel. In Psalm 94, verse 1, it says, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. Lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth. Render a reward to the proud. Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they utter and speak hard things, and all the workers of iniquity boast themselves? They break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. Yet they say, O Lord, shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. Understand ye brutish among the people, and ye fools, when will ye be wise? He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? He that chastiseth the heathen, shall he not correct? He that teacheth man knowledge, shall he not know? The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law, that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity, until the pit be digged for the wicked." So we see another trait of the brutish man. He believes his wickedness is hidden from the eyes of God. And he, he acts as though he faces no consequences for his wicked actions. And these are often the same people who claim that there's no God. And as, a fool, you know, as the proverb says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But even then, there are kings who judge wickedly, and they believe they're not accountable to anybody. But they are accountable to God. Because those positions are given as authority by God. So they're accountable to him. And God will judge all. Some of them might be judged immediately, but some of them are just storing up wrath for the day of wrath. That's why they live long lives. And it looks like, you know, sometimes it looks like they're winning, but they won't win. We know what the end of them is. That's why we can rejoice in that. You know, they're storing up wrath for the day of wrath. God will judge all. And the wise man, he understands both the long-suffering nature of God and the judgment of God, but the brutish man does not. That's why we fear God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge and understanding. So we're looking now, if you want to turn to Daniel chapter 4. This is now the pride of Nebuchadnezzar. So, in, I mean, I, I don't know how many... I assume the most people here have read Daniel, but you know the story of how... He lived as a beast for seven years. God turned him into a beast and made him live outside and eat grass and, you know, for seven years. So he was made a spectacle and humiliated. Um, and this is after that humiliation. This is what Nebuchadnezzar has to say in verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 34. It says, And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honoured him that liveth forever whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honour and brightness returned unto me, and my counsellors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom." An excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. 
Now, of course, this man's speaking from first-hand account. Like, he, you know, this is a completely different side that you see of the brutish man who was completely just ignorant, walking after, you know, creating idols of himself, being violent towards, you know, not just the people of God, but also to all the people in his kingdom, uh, making hasty decrees. But now he's humbled himself and he's actually, you know, giving all the glory to God as he should and understands that, you know, well, before he was acting like there was no judgment coming to him. Now he understands there is a God that judges and he's giving him all the glory. And we see here as well that it says, you know, at the same time, my reason returned unto me. So the Lord's given us a sound mind as people of God. He's given us the mind of Christ and we can grow wise through his word. But it begins with praising God, recognizing him as God and the saviour of all men. It took quite a spectacle and some harsh judgment and chastisement on Nebuchadnezzar. But as I said, not everyone's going to get that. Sometimes all they get is just you going door to door, preaching them the word. But they need to make sure they don't answer a matter before they heareth it. You know, because it's a fool who will answer a matter before he hears, you know, before he hears the conclusion of it. That we're going to preach the gospel. We're telling them about the resurrection, you know. Sure, they can mock after they've heard it, but most people don't even hear it. They don't even give you the chance to give them the good news, to give them news of the resurrection. But that was the thing. For, for him, he had to become an actual beast and, and live for seven years. But that's because he was incredibly brutish and stubborn uh, and proud. And this is the thing with us. When the Lord shows us that we have these traits, then we should immediately just go, how do I fix this? You know, this is not how I should be. This is, you know, if, I'm, if I find myself just getting quick to anger all the time, it's like, I've got to work on this. I've got to repent to God and do something about this. And, you know, and just get in the word and find what he has to say about how we can not be like that, how we can walk according to the way he's told us to walk. Because we're not to be brutish. You know, again, we're to flee from idolatry and covetousness. We're to flee from superstition. Trust not in your riches and harden not your neck to reproof. And be not proud but humble and receive the chastisement of God and the correction of men. Because a lot of the times your brother will come to correct you. It's because he loves you. It's because he's seeing something wrong. He's like, hey, you know, maybe, you know, this is what I've noticed. You know, this is not, this is not a good way to live. You're just sort of hurting yourself. And you don't, you don't want your brother to be hurting himself. So you want to correct him, you know, with the word of God when you see, see a problem. In, uh, I'll get you to turn to Psalms 49. I'll read to you from Proverbs 30, verse 7, 7, 8, and 9. It says, Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove, me far, remove fr far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my, my God in vain. So the Apostle Paul, he found contentment, whatever state he was in. And we see that same thing here in the proverb. But that's how we should be. It's foolish to chase riches and to desire wealth on this earth. You know, as it says, the love of, the money is root, love of money is the root of all evil. And, you know, again, only a fool and a brutish man would choose that path. So in, in Psalm 49, verse 6, we see this here. It says, they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth forever. That he should still live forever and not see corruption. For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish, and leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that the houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man being in honour abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. This, is their, this their way is their folly. Yet their posterity approve their sayings. Selah. So again, we're going to see that they're going to perish like the rest, like the beasts of the earth. Look, everyone's going to die someday. For us, we'll not see death. We'll not taste of the second death, but we'll go straight to heaven when, when we pass from this earth. But everyone's going to pass away from this earth. And it says that even the wise and the brutish, they all just leave their belongings behind. There's nothing you can take with you. And that's why it's foolish to, to be going after those things on this earth because none of it can follow you. Continue in verse 14, Psalm 49. 
Tis like sheep they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Selah. So again, the brutish men, they think their riches continue on forever, but they leave their riches to others and their name is forgotten. And that's the pride and haughtiness of the brutish man. And we see in verses 7, 7, 8 and 15, you know, you cannot redeem your soul or your brother with riches. You can't buy your way into heaven. You know, there's, there's nothing you own that can get you anything. You know, as Brother Sam preached a great sermon last week, you're filthy rags. You know, you can hold them up all you like, but they're worthless. You can't pay your way into heaven. There's nothing you can do. You've got to believe on the finished work of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. You've got to believe that he's our atonement, that his blood and his resurrection paid for it. We'll continue in, in verse 16 of Psalm 49. Be not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house has increased. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lived, he blessed his soul, and men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. He shall go to the generation of his fathers, they shall never see light. Man that is in honour and understandeth not is like the beasts that perish. So I like there how it says his glory will not descend after him. So those of us who trust in the Lord, we'll ascend, we'll ascend. we're going up. You know, we're not going down like the beasts of the earth, we're going up. And we'll never see death, but our riches also will not follow us from this earth. But we have riches in heaven that we have to look forward to. We've got that you know, heavenly kingdom. We've got a mansion. We've got gold, silver, precious stones. The rewards, the crowns that God has got for us. But it says, you know, their riches, when they see death, they will descend to the pit and their riches will not follow them. Their glory won't follow them. You know, their name will be forgotten. You know, so, but that's what it says about British people is, you know, they, they care about the things of this world. They want, they want to be rich on this world. They want to be seen as, you know, as the best kind of people. But just know that what the, what the end is for every man will be remembered in heaven. Our names are written up there forever, you know, but their names, they'll be forgotten. You won't remember anybody who goes down into the pit. And that's why Christ said, Hard, hardly shall a rich man who's trusting his riches enter into the kingdom of heaven because they're fools. And they're brutish in their understanding. That's why God says, when will you be wise? You know, he wants them to be wise. But they're, they're choosing to remain in their ignorance. And I'd also put it to you that those who believe that they can lose their salvation are brutish people. At very least, they're foolish people. But people who believe that there's another Jesus, you know, and that, that other Jesus is a false god. You know, like any other idol, it's the, you know... They can't save you. They can't hear, see, or anything like that. We have a living God who came and died for us. If you don't believe in that Jesus, you've got another Jesus. And that Jesus can't save anybody. And quite often we find that they're willfully ignorant of that as well, but not always. There are some people who just haven't heard the truth, but when they hear it, they receive it. And, you know, then they've just become children of God. And amen to that. But, of course, we know in, in Galatians 3, you know, O foolish Galatians who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only what I learn of you, received you the Spirit by the works of the law, by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun of the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? And we know that no man is just, as it says in you know, verse 11, no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, for it's evident the just shall live by faith. You know, these are people who believe that if I just believe on Christ and then I have to keep, keep myself from sinning, you know, they believe they can lose their salvation if they, if they commit any sins or if, you know, that what Jesus did wasn't enough. They haven't believed on Christ, they're not saved. You know, you know and I believe that's, that's a very brutish man who would, who would even do that, who would believe that they can lose their salvation because then it wasn't eternal. They don't believe in the finished work of Christ. And they're still trusting in their filthy rags. You know, they're, they're still trusting in this filthy rags of unrighteousness. Because the judgment of God's coming, and that's why we warn them. But they don't believe that Jesus already came and sacrificed himself to pay for them. They don't believe that. But they're not ignorant to it, because they believe it's, their, it's by faith plus works. So they're not ignorant. A lot of them are choosing to remain ignorant. 
in that. And I say those men who choose to remain ignorant are brutish. Because we know that the precious blood of Christ covers all. And if it was acceptable for the Father to pay for our sins, you know, then of course it's acceptable for me. But I'll get to, you know, we'll start wrapping it up soon. So we're going to be looking at some things on what this means to us. I mean, those of us who are saved, we have the Spirit of God, but there are still things we can take away from this sermon. And one of those things is we are called to be fools to the world, but wise in Christ. We as a church, we're also not to suffer fools in the church or in our personal lives, because as we know, the wisdom of the world is foolishness, and they can never be as wise as God's word. So in uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18... It says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it's the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this word? world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Down to verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Down to verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus who of God made us unto wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. But it it says there in verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus you know, so those of us who are in Christ Jesus, who God made us unto wisdom. So God hasn't made us to be brutish. He hasn't made us to be foolish. He's made us unto wisdom. And unto his wisdom, not the world's wisdom. Because then, if we're in, the, in his wisdom, then we can glory in the Lord. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 4. And my speech and my pre- preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Uh, Verse 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared to them to love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So again, God wants us to know his spiritual things. That's why he's given us the Spirit of God, because those things in the Scriptures have to be spiritually discerned. So he wants us to know them. That's why we've got to read our Bibles. We've got to study and understand the Word of God through the Spirit of God, not through the foolishness of men. In 1 Corinthians 4 verse 9, it says, For I think that God has set forth, up, set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels and to men, we are fools for Christ's sake, but, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honourable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. And labour, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. And we are made as the filth of the world and are the offscaring of all things unto this day. So we see just how far the apostles were made fools to the world. And, you know, the spectacle that they were made, but that was to drive the witness of Christ's death and resurrection even further, was making these people a spectacle, much like he made Nebuchadnezzar a spectacle. But that's the thing, if you preach the word of God without compromise, then the world is going to see you as a fool too. And you will be made a spectacle, but we're commanded to still remain wise in Christ. Ephesians 5.15 says, See that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So we're not to be foolish or brutish. We're to grow in the understanding and to put silence the ignorant men through both our well-doing and our knowledge of God's wisdom. You know, of course, we know 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And he goes on to name a couple of men, but those men were causing others to stumble through their lies. They hadn't studied to show themselves approved, so they didn't know these guys were lying to them. 
and they can lead many away. But uh, again, we should know the truth and we should teach it to men. That's why we have preachers. That's why we, you know, as men, we get together and we discuss the word of God between services and other times during the week because we want to know the word of God. We want to correct each other and make sure that we, we understand the word of God and that no one's going to come in here and lead us away because we study the word. We know the word. We have the wisdom of God and we know the truth. So we're not going to suffer these fools even for an hour. If they, if they walk in here, as Paul commanded them, you know, he said, I wouldn't even suffer them for an hour. They come in, they want to teach, you've got to be circumcised to be saved, you've got to be baptized to be saved. We're not going to tolerate that because we know the truth. And it even continues in 2 Timothy 2.23, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. So one of those snares of the devil is, is the brutish man, the man who lacks complete understanding of the things of God, and who is stubborn and proud in his ignorance. But that's the thing, you know, we're... We're not to strive against these people. We're to, be, we're to actually know the word, be apt to teach and actually try and correct them and teach them in the things of God that perhaps they might be given repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. They might get saved, you know, but they might not if they choose to be stubborn. You know, that's completely up to them. But we just do our job and we just preach the word and we don't compromise. You know, we, we instruct them lovingly in truth. But that's the thing, if they won't hear the correction from the word of God, then we just leave them to, leave them to their filth. You know, it's not our job to correct everybody. We just, we give them the word of God. If they won't receive it after an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. You know, there's so many commandments in the Bible. It just makes it so clear how to deal with these people. You give them a chance, but you don't give them unlimited chances. Because God doesn't. But we also need to make sure that we as Christians don't have these attributes either. So we're to grow in the knowledge and wisdom of God through preaching and through the Holy Scriptures. We receive correction when it's presented to us from the Word of God and not be proud but actually show humility and a willingness to change. So I'll start wrapping up here in Proverbs chapter 30. So we know brutish men can be saved but it's not something we should be. God wants us strong in wisdom, knowledge and understanding as I said before, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all these things, of wisdom, knowledge and understanding. So first getting saved and then learning and growing in the Lord and his word, that's how we overcome these brutish traits. We read how the Lord wants us to act and then we just try and walk after the way he's commanded us. But part of that is knowing what he commands and then doing the works he's prepared for us. So in Proverbs chapter 30 verse 2, says, surely I am more brutish than any man and have not the understanding of a man. I have learned, neither learned wisdom nor have the knowledge of the holy. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So how do we ensure that we are not brutish or foolish men? So the word of God and the wisdom of God, that's how we receive instruction. The word is nigh unto us. We don't need to go hunt for it. That's the thing. We have the King James Bible right here. We don't need to go to heaven to bring it down. We don't need to go under, underground to bring it up, you know, we have the perfect preserved word of God, the King James Bible. That's our instruction in righteousness. And no other version is going to cut it because they all corrupt. I went through and had a look with Brother Jason about some of the corruptions on what they do to change about the brutish man, about the foolish man. And they just, just all the versions just completely twist it and corrupt it. You can't even understand the passages anymore. So if you want the truth... And if you want instruction from Christ, you have to have the King James Bible. It's the only one that's accurate. The only one that actually, some of them even don't even have the word brutish in the entire Bible. And yet it, you can see how many times it comes up. It's such a big theme in the even Old and New Testament. You know, so the Spirit of God will guide us 
through this book into all truth, because it is a living book. We should also, you know, we should read it all, read our Bible daily, but listen to good counsel, listen to good preaching. We read the word daily and we seek whether those things are so, as the Bereans did. So what are some takeaways from this? We know that we live under wicked, br- violent, brutish leaders in our nations, but we can still be a Daniel in that nation, one who will not compromise, who has the Lord's protection, the wisdom of God as our strength. Um, and also, th- another point too, going to the law before the world. You're being judged by brutish and foolish men, by you know, wicked and unjust men by the fornicators of this world, the murderers, you know, you're going in front of the worst kind of people. That's why we're commanded to, you know, to, to judge those things in the church because even the least esteemed amongst us, you know, I'd rather have a, a saved 10-year-old judge me than to go before the wicked, brutish world and stand in front of their ju- judicial system because it's completely corrupt. But we can get God's judgment in, in the house of God. That's why it says, you know, judgment must begin at the house of God. For us, that's where it begins and ends. Um, but even brutish men, whether they're the, the unsaved kind or if they're a brother in Christ, they're just not people you can learn anything from. You know, even if they're a brother, try and correct them. But if you realise this person's just brutish and stubborn and will not receive correction, then just leave them be. Just, you know, that's why this church discipline, they cast out that Satan, you know, would have his way with them. It's not no longer the church's problem unless they repent and come back. You know, they're given out for the destruction of the flesh. You can't help the people who are too proud to receive correction. But we should also make sure that we, we have the wisdom of God, the word of God, but those people, they lack both. We should make sure we increase in the word, in the works we do and in the wisdom of the Lord, lest we do become proud, boastful, covetous, idolatrous, or discontent, and last of all, foolish and brutish men. So I'll finish on Psalm 92. Um, as we read before the, uh, before the sermon, in verse 5, O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this. When the wicked spring as the grass, and when the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is they that shall be destroyed forever. But thou, Lord, art most high forevermore. For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, Thine enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. So we know they shall be scattered and destroyed as the grass. But the Lord and his children will abide forever. And so we can have these attributes if we aren't careful. And if we happen to yoke up with the brutish and foolish men. But as God's people, we should walk as children of God. With wisdom, knowledge, understanding and righteousness. So we need to read our Bibles daily and do the works we've been called to do, and study to show ourselves approved under God. So do you mind praying, Brother Caleb?